Good morning, Colorado. You're listening to The Daily Sunup. The Daily Sunup podcast is a conversation with the Colorado Sun. See our trust indicators at coloradosun.com slash ethics. It's Thursday, October 10th. Today, Western Slope freelance reporter Nancy Lawham talks about what it was like inside the courtroom covering the Tina Peters election breach trial and sentencing. Before we begin, AARP Colorado empowers older people to choose how they live as they age. From making Colorado communities more livable and age-friendly to supporting family caregivers, AARP Colorado is a wise friend and a fierce defender. Visit aarp.org co for more info. Now let's go back in time with some Colorado history. In October 1890, Otto Mears transformed Colorado's rugged San Juan Mountains by launching the Rio Grande Southern Railroad, replacing horses with trains on his 300-mile toll road from Ridgeway to Placerville. After miners forced the Utes to surrender the region in 1873, Mears connected burgeoning communities, expanding the railroad to Telluride and Rico by 1891. Despite the panic of 1893 reducing business, the railroad survived and introduced the innovative galloping geese truck train hybrids during the Great Depression. The railroad transported metals, cattle, and radioactive ore until automobiles led to its closure in 1951. Before we continue, The Unaffiliated is Colorado's premier must-read politics and policy newsletter. Each week, our award-winning politics team gives you breaking news, explainers, and behind-the-scenes analysis you won't find anywhere else. Become a Colorado Sun Premium member today at coloradosun.com slash join to sign up for the unaffiliated and other member-exclusive newsletters. Next, our feature story. Hey, thanks for joining us today, everybody. I'm David Krause, one of the editors here at The Sun, and today we're switching things up and bringing in one of our Longtime Western Slope journalist and friend of the Colorado Sun, Nancy Lawfall. Nancy, I thought I'd have you jump in and give our listeners just kind of a, a taste and and what it was like for you uh, based out in Grand Junction. You do a lot of Western Slope uh, reporting for us. We go back to the, our days at the Denver Post uh, when you were working out there in the, in the West Slope. Um you have been covering the Tina Peters trial start to finish, um, been around it for a few years now, Nan. So thought I'd jump in and just see about um, giving our listeners an idea of what that was like, um, maybe spin forward as well. So Nancy, just some background. How many days did you spend in that courtroom in Mesa County? You know, what was it like? Uh, who was in there for this um, election denier uh, trial? See, I was in the courtroom for 10, 11 days. That's including the trial and then the sentencing. And it was it was probably the craziest 10, 11 days I've ever spent in the, in the Justice Center here in Grand Junction. Um, it was packed every time with supporters of Tina. And it got testy sometimes. You know, there was some yelling, pushing, shoving going on. And I hadn't experienced that before in any hearings I'd covered. So yeah, it was it was a very interesting proceeding, including trial and sentencing. Nancy, we talked about it before. You uh, covered numerous uh, court cases. Walk through some of the twists and turns. You know, a lot of times we just see you know arraignments and hearings and you know, set up and then the trial. And, and it usually, it there's usually not a lot of uh, twists and turns, but Nancy, talk about some of those um, that you experienced and what that was like for you as you're trying to navigate this thing over, what, a couple of years? Yeah, Tina's trial had actually been delayed for, I think it was almost three years. She kept... Um, firing attorneys right before a hearing was scheduled. The trial was scheduled, so they would have to delay it. At one point, there was a hearing she had COVID, so um, they had to delay that one. And finally, you know, you get the trial going, and, um, you know, nobody thought that it was actually going to happen and make it through that nine days it was scheduled. Uh, But they did. They were able to pick a jury. Um, There were... 
she had four attorneys that were there with her. So there were there were lots and lots and lots of um, I guess twists and turns with that with objections. And I've never seen a trial that had that many objections because the attorneys would not stick to what they were supposed to be talking about. They wanted to talk about election fraud, and that wasn't actually part of this trial. And what was it like, Nancy, to your point, she, uh, at what point uh, Tina Peters violated parole orders, she filed a suit to sue uh, Merrick Garland uh, and tried to get the Supreme Court to hear her case. What was it like, not only before those motions were filed, but then after You know, like it it felt like, you know, all these different lifelines were getting thrown out there. What was it like each time you would come back after one of these procedures that would veer off a little bit? Well, to tell you the truth, I I wasn't surprised. You know, I kept expecting this to go off the rails. And and that's why I said even even when the trial actually happened right up until the day that it happened, I was still expecting something to blow up so that it wouldn't happen. Um, And then throughout the trial, I kept expecting something, a mistrial or something to happen. And it didn't. I mean, it was amazing that it actually went through the process, went the sentencing. And now, of course, there's going to be appeals. Uh, it's, It's not over yet. And uh, so far, those haven't been filed, even though one of her attorneys said that he would file one by noon the day after the sentencing, but um, I haven't seen anything yet. So, Nancy, what was your interactions? You know, you, you've talked to Tina in the past. Had you worked with Tina at all when she was Mesa County clerk for any election things before this? Or, you know, how how was that community? To your point, there's a lot of people supporting her. Yeah, I had really not worked with her. Um, there were no stories I, that I can think of that I did that involved um, interviewing her. Uh, but I started to hear little rumbles and grumbles out of her office that things were not going well. People were leaving in droves. Um, you know, there were some kind of weird decisions being made. Uh, but I didn't cover it at that point. It wasn't until uh, the whole... Um, South Dakota thing when she went up to my pillow guys seminar that was when I really went oh I've got to pay attention to his clerk because this is this is not your normal county clerk story what's it been like of the past two years um, Mesa County is a Republican stronghold area a lot of talk in the community Nancy I would think a lot of people who were following the trial were coming up and talk to you, to you. What was that? What were some of those conversations like? Actually, a lot of people at the trial itself did not want to talk to me. There was, there was always um, half of the courtroom was packed with Tina supporters. And if you tried to talk to them outside the, uh, the courtroom on breaks and stuff, they, they were not very open to talking. In fact, they would insult me and (laughs) walk away. Um, I did find a couple, you know, that talked, and then they would say, oh, we didn't like your reporting, so we're not going to talk anymore. That's been the the way with Tina supporters throughout this. I mean, going back to when she was having, um, they were having rallies for her, and there would be, you know, 100, 150 people show up for those. And they were always very, very down on the mainstream media. So I've never had the chance to really get to talk to anybody to say, what is it about Tina that you find so compelling, you know, to support? Talk about there was a lot of uh, attention to this, not just locally, but nationally. Any conversations with uh, Mike Lindell? He was out there. Ricky Schroeder at one point came out. Is that right? And how was that that day, Nancy? Oh, yeah. Ricky Schroeder was there um, for most of the trial, and he was there for the sentencing. And he was maybe one of her most unfriendly supporters. Uh, I saw him, let's see, I guess it was like the second day of the trial. I had taken a, a picture of him the day before with my phone. 
and he um, saw me standing there and flipped me the bird. <laughs> and so he, he never spoke to me after that. He would just give me dirty looks. Nancy, let's spin it forward a little bit. Uh, you you touched on it. Um, were you surprised that the judge... Um, talk about his um, demeanor that last day. I think we a lot of people who've seen some of these bigger cases kind of see when the judge finally does sentencing uh, he or her. Uh, you could tell they're finally, their frustrations are kind of start coming out. Did you see that um, with this judge? And what was that sentencing um, when he, he when he handed down the sentencing, what was that like in the courtroom and the the mood of the judge? Yeah, I felt like uh, Judge Barrett was letting off some steam at the, the sentencing. Um, he had been really, I was i was impressed. I had never been in his courtroom before to cover anything. And so I didn't know what to expect with him. But he, he was very even-handed throughout the trial, even when... Uh, you know, I, I would have thought he would would have gotten really frustrated with these four defense attorneys who kept refusing to follow his orders and kept trying to wade into the weeds of, of election fraud. So when the sentencing happened, I think he finally, you know, he got his chance to say what he thought. And he was very um, eloquent but also very scathing about Tina's uh, actions. Yeah, I thought some of the the quotes that you had in the story, and like I mentioned at the beginning, just the way it all flowed, you could tell the frustration in the courtroom once it, it went away. Um, what was it like outside the courtroom after the sentencing names? It was quiet. There wasn't much, uh, you know, nobody wanted to talk about it. All the supporters kind of wandered off and, and left. It wasn't like uh, during the trial where, where people would be mingling around, lots of talk, and uh, it was it was just quiet. And I think a lot of those people, from what I've heard, a lot of them didn't expect her to be taken off to jail at that point. They thought she was going to come back out with them. So I think that maybe some of them were a little stunned. That's interesting. I thought that's where we could... Uh, spin it forward, um, you know, like we like to do on the sun up, what's coming next, uh, surprised. Were you surprised? It, you know, it seemed like the judge was really intent on, there wasn't any hesitation for him to, uh, have her go directly. Um, Nancy, she'll go to Mesa County jail for up to six months and then head over to a, uh, uh, state prison. What was, what, what, were you surprised by that immediate um, uh, sentencing and spin forward on um, what do you think's coming up in the next few weeks? I wasn't really surprised that they took her directly to jail um, because she's been so, you know, over the top about um, all this election fraud stuff and trying to make money off of it and trying to stir up her supporters. So I, I, kind of thought the judge might might want to get her out of circulation immediately, which he did. As far as where where it's going to go now, I've been asking and I haven't I don't have a clear answer on whether she could get out on appeal. Um, I don't think so, but uh, it looks like she she will be in the Mason County jail like I said at least for or up to six months. it could be just uh, six weeks. And then she'll go to to wherever. <laughs> I'm not sure. Nobody knows where they're where they'll be moving her right now. But yeah, I think she's she's going to be behind bars for a while. And in the meantime, I have I've been watching her social media, and she does have supporters who are still shilling for donations while she's in there, and and they talk to her occasionally, and they've been able to to put messages out there for the supporters. Nancy, it was certainly was an interesting um, few years on this one. Um, appreciate you taking the time to uh, jump in and just kind of give us some insight on what it was like to be in there. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, for listening. You can watch for more updates on this, I'm sure, from Nancy as she keeps poking around 
and also uh, read her story from last week's sentencing. You can check those out at coloradosun.com. Nance, thanks again for joining us and uh, make it a great weekend. All right, you too. And there will be more. You can read more at coloradosun.com. Finally, here are a few stories that you should know about today. Two eagles are looking for a new place to nest in Boulder County after lightning hit the tree where they had raised eaglets for years. Just the female was perched in the tree when it was hit, and she survived and has been seen flying with her mate to find a new tree. The lightning strike was captured by wildlife cameras watching the nest, and the video is posted inside our story at coloradosun.com. An end is in sight for the years-long 16th Street Mall revamp in downtown Denver. Mayor Mike Johnston confirmed this week the $170 million remodel will be finished by summer 2025. The project was supposed to be finished this year, but delayed after crews unearthed utilities and a century-old brick-lined sewer underneath 16th Street. A stretch of the mall reopened this week to much fanfare, and the city's biggest promoter of downtown shared their achievements but said there are challenges to get downtown Denver back to full operations. A statewide amendment on the Colorado ballot would create an independent board of citizens, lawyers, and judges to hold misconduct hearings against judges and impose sanctions. The new adjudicative board would be separate from the current review commission consisting of appointees by the Colorado Supreme Court and the governor. Amendment H, which needs 55% of the vote to pass, would also open access to a judge's disciplinary records. To read more about the 14 statewide ballot measures, visit coloradosun.com. For more information on all of these stories, visit our website, coloradosun.com. And don't forget to tune in again next time. Now, a quick message from our team. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. My name is Jason Blevins. I'm the outdoors writer here at the Colorado Sun, co-founder of the Colorado Sun. Um, I'm on the uh, weekly podcast with David Krause every Monday. And I also write a weekly newsletter. comes out every Thursday. It's called The Outsider. Um, take a look at uh, each issue has sort of early glimpses of stories. I got stuff on housing, high country business, high country culture, public lands, uh, public land managers, kind of just about anything kind of interesting and happening on the Western Slope. Try to get into it. Ski industry stuff. Um, I invite you to come check it out. It's one of the many newsletters we have at the Colorado Sun. Um, head to coloradosun.com slash join and become a member and support the Colorado Sun. Appreciate you guys listening. Thanks. <laughs>